What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. We're coming to you from Jacksonville, Florida, after the Atlanta Falcons beat the Jaguars 21-14 to in an absolutely have to frickin' have it opportunity to end a two-game losing streak, win a game, and stay in the NFC playoff picture. The Falcons did exactly that with this 21-14 to victory that got a little close at the end, but it still counts as a W. That's really all that matters. And in this fi- Falcons Final Whistle podcast, uh, which I am Scott Baer, and as always joined by Tori McElhaney and Chris Rim, and we're going to talk about Cordero Patterson coming back. We are going to talk about the running game waking up, how this defense did, and we are, as we always do, we are going to look forward and see what the Falcons have to do next to stay in the mix. So, Tori, with all of that being said, what was your big takeaway from this game, which the Falcons kind of controlled and then lost control of right. at the end? Yeah, I, I think, and we'll get into all of this in more detail, but for me it really was seeing Cordero Patterson come back into the fold and not just come back into the fold, but to play the way that he did and have the day that he did because I think it would be one thing if the Falcons would have brought him back and (laughs) like he doesn't do anything but he comes back and has this really dynamic performance that it really showcased why this offensive operation needs him so much yeah I mean clearly the MVP there uh Chris Rim what what was your big takeaway uh from this one I think sorry to do the same thing but I think I, I would say the same I think the way Cordero played and, and it was clear that he was at, at least the way it looked, it didn't look like he was hundred percent, like almost every play he was uh, limping at times, but the, he was so explosive and you could just tell the difference between what we saw, for, you know, against the Patriots versus in the, the way the offense really in the last two games and the difference he makes, um, you know, in the offense. So I thought he, he was my biggest takeaway. Yeah. And we're going to talk a lot more about CP as we move through this, podcast. But before we do, let's give a big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, like this Falcons final whistle podcast. Learn about all the awesome new features of Windows 11 at windows.com. And we are starting quarter number one talking about the man of the hour, evening, afternoon, Cordero Patterson was just awesome. Uh, Tori, his his numbers were pretty pretty great in his first game back. Yeah, they were. I mean, I'm just kind of looking at them right now, but 16 carries, 108 yards, an average of 6.8 yards a carry, which I think that is – that number to me is really huge. I mean, it's one thing to go 100 yards in a game, but to average almost seven yards – per carry I think is really big and the fact that he makes up such a large chunk of what the overall rushing attack was the Falcons finished the night with 149 rushing yards and Cordero Patterson is 108 of those yards and I just and even then like he even had two catches for 27 yards I mean this is somebody who Arthur Smith said it best I think after the game where he said he just adds another element to what we can do and Keith Smith after the game said it changes the way that defenses look at us as an offense. And and I think that's so important when you're talking about who the Falcons are as an offensive operation, and they are not the same team with Cordero Patterson as they are without him. And I think we have seen that come kind of full, full circle as an entire dialogue, looking at what they were against the Patriots versus now what we saw them do against Jacksonville. So I think like when you're talking about this offense, you can't not talk about Cordero Patterson. And I think I've said before and I've written it before, like he is, if there's a spark plug for this offense, it's Cordero Patterson. Yeah, I mean, he was just incredible. And in his post-game press conference, the man's future is so bright, he's got to wear shades. He didn't even oh, yeah. take them off. And he was enjoying the moment. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. 100%. And, and as he, he should. As yeah, he should. He, he has every right to be confident and to be proud of what he was able to do. And there was a prevailing question to a lot of people that, that took the podium after this victory. And it's, what kind of an impact does Cordero Patterson have? Well, I mean, duh, a huge one. But he was even asked that. And he's like, hey, yeah. you know, like, I'm a big part of this offense. And he didn't even return kicks. He's just become an offensive weapon. And just to see how much of a spark he gives them, how much of an added element that he gives, 
uh, it really stood out. It's funny because I'm, I'm looking at the quote right now. And he said, his quote was, I'm a big part of this offense. That's a no-brainer, man. From the outside looking in, you can see that. Like I've all told you before, I love it here. I mean, that's a great quote. And, he, and he's talking about here, meaning Atlanta. And I right. think you can't talk about Cordero Patterson in the year he's had without talking about the way that Arthur Smith has really cracked the Cordero Patterson code. Yeah, and he fired off a pretty nice tweet at the end, basically oh, yeah. just saying that I freaking love you, Atlanta, only he didn't say freaking. Um, Are we a PG podcast? I think we'd like to keep it oh, okay, okay. family friendly. Gotcha. Okay. But it's not mandatory. <laughs> uh, Chris, you brought up a good point, too, that he didn't look 100%, right? Does that kind of make you wonder, gosh, if, if he can get back going and this run game can, can uh, get going, can he do that again as a rusher? What do you think uh, well, about what you saw? Yeah, I think I think he definitely can. He look. I, I feel like today he also looked a lot more comfortable as a running back than he has before. I, I'm not sure if that's because I don't know if that was I was seeing things, but I just I just feel like he looked comfortable back there and and so explosive. And then when you consider the fact that he on multiple plays today he was just he was limping, and then he called for a substitution at at one point, and um, the way he dominated, I think yeah, it's 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 looking very scary for the future for future defenses that have to deal with Cordero Patterson and, and the Falcons. It's funny that you say he looks more comfortable, and I, I will add that I feel like a lot of people would look comfortable when you have the space that I think this offensive line provided. That was something that was a very stark difference, and I know we'll get into more of the run game as a whole entire operation um, in the second quarter, but just from the perspective, like they, they had room to run, which is something that I feel like we haven't been able to say in a while, that they had significant room. They weren't getting hit at the line of scrimmage, which is something that we have seen happen time and time again, over, especially over the last probably like month and a half. Yeah, and, and we are going to dive m- uh, more into that uh, run game element as a whole, but over the last 20 seconds, I'm just going to stand on a soapbox and say, look, we all know it's going to be tough to extend Patterson. Every time he has a game like this, his price goes up. Mm -hmm. And, heck, if somebody wanted to offer me the most amount of money, I'm going to look pretty hard at that. We all chase the almighty dollar, right? But can the Falcons find a creative way to keep him here? He loves loves Atlanta. He's already said that. Arthur Smith, as, as you put it, has kind of cracked the uh, code. What can, would he want to go somewhere else where that's not a guarantee? Right. Or can they find a way to give him a couple-year extension to keep him as part of this offensive core moving forward? I think that's going to be a fascinating storyline to watch as we head towards the offseason. And we're sticking with the Falcons' ground game over the five minutes of quarter number two, talking about how the Falcons' run game seemed to have its best day at the office against the Jacksonville Jaguars, which coming into this game, we're only allowing 3.9 yards per carry. Mm-hmm. They did pretty well, Tori, uh, being able to, to, to rack up yards, uh, Patterson and some of the other backs. Yeah, uh, you know, you bring up a good point that, you know, this one, I know we're playing, the Falcons are playing Jacksonville, and there's a lot that can be said about this Jacksonville team, but they were third in the league in run defense. That's yeah. not something that you can just kind of overlook. It doesn't matter how what the, the record is. If you're looking at a team that's, doing really well in one specific aspect of a game when the Falcons can kind of go out and they averaged about five yards a carry. That's really good for this Falcons offense that hasn't been able to do that in many, many games this season. Um, I think what's really interesting, and this was a storyline that I kind of wrote about post game, was we were talking to players and, and Arthur Smith after the game, and something that came up, especially when we were talking to Cordero Patterson, was he was talking about how Arthur Smith got on this offense about essentially challenging them to be better in the run game. And and he was showing them – Keith Smith said that he showed them examples of moments that they were able to put something together in terms of running the ball and how he challenged them to go out and be better. And it was a conversation that they had from Wednesday all the way to Sunday. And I think that storyline to me was very, very fascinating because I'm sitting here thinking like – when I hear Cordero Patterson talking about 
well, Arthur Smith brought this up to us. And when Arthur Smith says something like you listen, it's like, you know, he got all over them, it, like all over them about running the ball. Like, with you, loud noises. With loud noises and probably words that wouldn't make the uh, PG version of this podcast. But that's coaching. That's holding your players accountable for like, hey, I know you can do this. We've seen you do it. Here are examples of you doing it. Go out and do it. And the fact that they were kind of able, especially in that first half, to kind of answer that challenge, and it, I, think, I think was really good to see. Uh, Chris, outside of CP, were there any other uh, heroes from, from the uh, running game that uh, you thought uh, played a big part? and what they were able to do on the ground. Well, I mean, I think it, it was pretty much kind of all TV, but I, I think if, if, the, if there is any anyone else to look at, I thought, I, well, I thought as a, as a whole, everyone looked better, but I think in terms of, you know, finding the, I'm kind of going to skip back to, to CP here, but I think what, what stands out to me when I watch him run the ball, and I think maybe it's something you learn as a kick returner, but the way he he finds holes um, in in the offensive line, the yeah. way he bursts things out when needed to be, the way he the way he navigates the when he's running the ball is just different from the other backs. But with that being said, I thought Wayne Gallman and Mike Davis both looked a lot better than they have you know all season. And uh, Gallman averaged almost five yards a carry, and and, and Mike a little bit over three. Um, so I, I think the rest of the rushing game could definitely continue as the season goes on, as long as you know they're, they're able to find those running lanes. And, and as Tori pointed out, the, the running lanes are there. Yeah, I think a, a point that you made about like CP finding those holes. It's also really interesting that when Arthur Smith talks about Cordero Patterson, he really talks about the physicality of which he runs with. And that's the thing is like when you're watching Cordero Patterson run, I remember saying if he can get to his third or fourth step, he right. is so hard to bring down and he is such a hard runner. And I think that it, it, we saw that happening throughout the course uh, of this game, which I found very, very interesting. Yeah, and I, I, I think the big question is, is this repeatable? Arthur Smith said maybe they can do it again. Maybe they – he didn't say maybe they can't, but it's, it's, it's kind of open-ended. To, to do this once helps one win. To do this several times can help the Falcons reach their goals because this rushing game has been inefficient. Right. So can they do it again? Can they find this spark and, and continue it moving forward? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I, and that's what Arthur Smith said after the game. I thought that was very candid of him to kind of be like, you know, it worked today, but we have a whole set of challenges against Tampa next week. So it, it's one of those things where he, he's even kind of saying, like, we know we have our work cut out for us in order to find consistency in this area. Yeah, and they're going to have to find consistency. Their air attack was a little iffy, mm -hmm. um, and they have to find a way to put – everything together yep. offensively because they're going to have to score more than 21 points um, if they're going to stay up with some of the uh, better teams left on the schedule. And we're starting quarter number three on the other side of the football with the Falcons defense, which is looking better. Yes. No doubt. And yes. played a significant role, Chris Rim, in this victory. Yeah, I think – when you Arthur Smith said post game that I mean he didn't he didn't like emphasize it like a lot like he he doesn't emphasize a lot of things I guess with like a certain cadence in his voice but I thought when he did say that because the Falcons didn't convert a third down late in the fourth quarter and then they gave the ball to the Jaguars with I think just over two minutes left and and he said he when he was asked about if the third down was important or if he was frustrated by that he kind of just said there was no panic. And 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 I guess rightfully so, because, you know, the defense stepped up and they performed. They they got, you know, Trevor Lawrence to throw incomplete passes on, on four straight downs. And I think they've been a bright spot. And, and it's even in, in New England's in the loss to New England ever, ever since that Cowboys game, really. Um, I think they've turned a, they've turned a page in these past two weeks. Um, even though the scoreboard didn't show it last week, they sacked Mac Jones three times. A.J. Terrell had an interception. Deron Harmon got an interception today, and Anthony Rush forced a fumble. Grady Jarrett is always in the backfield and disrupting <laughs> uh, the defensive line. And he, while his numbers don't always tell the full story, he sets people up to to have mismatches. Like, for example, Dante Fowler, you know, on a sack today, he, he just frees people up to get one on one. So I think what we're seeing from this defense is is that it's trending in the right direction at the right time, and. 
next week, obviously against the Buccaneers, it'll be a, a tough test, a team that can win in many ways. I mean, Leonard Fournette had four touchdowns today, so wow. um, it'll it'll be tough. To, it'll be a, a test for them again next week. But as I think the defense is really showing how great they can be as everyone gets adjusted to what DMPs is trying to do. Yeah, and Tori, how do you think that they're that uh, that they're doing with what their defensive coordinator is? trying to teach them he said even back to the philly game he maybe had to scale some things back and now it's slowly getting rebuilt yeah um how do you think that they're doing within this game i i think that narrative is one of the most fascinating narratives of the entire season for me is you know i'm really y'all know how high up i am on the list of uh my favorite people dean pease is is very much up there i may i have no like I make that no secret and the feeling is mutual for those who didn't see the oh, yeah. press conference from two weeks ago he specifically said and I quote Tori's my favorite yeah it's because I I the, the love is mutual and I am super happy about it and I am absolutely going to get a mug for Christmas it'll be my Christmas present to myself that says Dean's favorite like you know in the office where it's like World's, world's greatest boss. Yeah, it's going to say Dean's favorite, and I'm going to hold it up every time he comes in. But, no, I digress. Um, one of my favorite storylines of the year is that he said that he put in too much. He installed too much too early and that he tapered it back and then has slowly been building it up and that it's at 30% of his entire playbook. And oh we gosh. were we were talking to Brandon Copeland – I can't remember. It was probably this past week or the week before. I can't remember when it was. All the weeks run together during the season. But Brandon Copeland said this quote, and I thought it was so great. He was like, this is not a defense for dummies. Yeah, and that right. was a great quote. I loved it so much, and I, I will find a way to kind of tattoo that on my forehead or something <laughs> um, because I loved it. And I think it just goes to show that with time and with adjustment and with a coach that kind of is starting – I mean, Dean Pease has said from the get-go, you – Play, you you play call to your personnel. If your personnel can't do it, why are you trying to do it consistently? Play call to what you have at your disposal. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing is this gigantic playbook that Dean Pease has has been – shrunk down to fit what this Falcons defense can do. And, and and I think that's something that's going to be probably overlooked, like in the different narratives of this season, regardless of how it turns out, that's going to be an overlooked um, storyline. But I think it's so important. And I think we're kind of seeing the effects of – this defense becoming more comfortable in what Dean Pease is asking them to do. Yeah, and one of Dean's things, I guess he doesn't say this directly, but – Yards don't matter, points do. Right. And they're getting pretty good at keeping you from crossing the goal line. Yeah. They've, they've given up two touchdowns o over the last two weeks. And this one against the Jags was a play or two after A.J. Terrell left. His replacement got beat for a touchdown. Yeah, they did that on purpose. Like, yeah, you, you see A.J. Right, after right, yeah, you see A.J. go out and it's like, well, let's, let's go after him. But it, it has been impressive, and I think that's how they can stay in these games. Limit Tampa, limit San Francisco, limit Carolina to field goals, not touchdowns. That allows you to overcome some mistakes. That allows you to stay in games and be in position to win late, which the Falcons have proven that they can do. And we're on to quarter number four, and we're going to try to look forward to the six remaining games left on the Falcons' schedule. They sit at five and six on the season. They are in, while well, there's a Monday night game with NFC teams that are going to impact it, but in the NFL's, I'm sorry, if the, in the NFC's playoff picture, the Falcons are in the eight slot, which means that they're in the mix. And I asked Matt Ryan after this victory, I said, uh, to be heading into the final month playing meaningful games, you know, how, how, like how how important is that? How important was this victory to that? And the guy's face just lit up. Yeah, he, he was, was excited. He was so excited yeah. to be in this position after a season like last year where it went south early. They never recovered. They fired a coach. It was not a good situation. And to be in this situation, I mean, are they in control of their own destiny? Not really. But they have an opportunity here to do something and not just play out the string. I think that means something. I think that's important yeah. for Arthur Smith's team building exercise in in his first season. Mm -hmm. But let's also just call it like it is, right? 
that what happened against Jacksonville at the end cannot happen against Tampa. Right. It can't happen against Carolina or San Francisco or Buffalo or New Orleans. The schedule gets tougher. Right. Yeah. Uh, they've got to be better there. Yeah. No, you're right. Because I when I'm looking, so if I'm just looking at the next four games, you have Tampa, Carolina, 49ers, Detroit. I, if the Falcons can go two for two, it, or in this next four game slate, I am good with that. Where the I think that it's going to be difficult because I think that Buccaneers is going to be hard. Carolina, I think, is trending in the right direction because of the players that they've gotten Cam Newton back and and they've gotten Christian McCaffrey back and, and these are conversations that change what we talk about what Cordero Patterson means to this Falcons offense. Right. How he changes it, same thing with Carolina. And then 49ers are trending in the right direction. Detroit is a winnable game, but can the Falcons play cohesively and together? Because we've seen moments where it hasn't been super complete. We haven't seen a complete game be put together yet. Um, So when I'm looking at the month of December, the Falcons have a chance here. But they have to find ways to play more completely and and to – play more competitively and see it, it's just really hard to kind of go into the next month and, and try and predict anything. I'm really not a big proponent of predictions. I don't like doing them um, because predictions are made to be wrong and I don't like being wrong because <laughs> I'm super competitive and I have to know like that I'm right all the time. True story. Um, that, that is absolutely true. Chris and Scott can attest to it. Um, but it, when I'm just thinking about this, it's just really hard to predict because you, you think that the Falcons could potentially go two for two, but it's really difficult to do that. Yeah, uh, for sure. Chris, uh, where do you think the, the Falcons are with, the the road getting tougher here. They weren't able to close out this this Jacksonville game and kind of dominate the way that they had started. Um, heading into the final month, they are playing meaningful games. Uh, what do you think needs to happen f- uh, for those meaningful games to set up meaningful stuff in January? Yeah, I think really the biggest thing for the Falcons is just focusing on playing four quarters of, of good football. I know that's generic, but in the when they played the Buccaneers last time, I think it was like – 20 to 17 or 28 to 17 and then there were back-to-back picks a uh, pick six and everything just went downhill and the score looked way worse than the actual game was um so i think in turn like tory broke it down here i mean i think today today the the and the nfl is so weird that teams look different each week but yeah. the, the panthers looked not great at all today they look right <laughs> i mean uh cam was pulled he i think he had a 6.8 qbr and mccaffrey got hurt again um so that that that's a game that's a game on the schedule like you said tory that that could that could be a winnable one but i think i think the the falcons are and the nfl as a whole is just odd like it like tory was saying, it's hard to predict anything because i think when i look at this it, i don't i don't look at any of these games and, and i'm pinging it as you know, the, this is this is a game that they can't win. And I guess you you don't say that about any game in the NFL, but I, I, I felt good about the, the way they played against the Buccaneers for a large portion of that game. That third quarter was arguably one of the best quarters that they've had. Yeah, and I think I – think, and, and it's hard. It's easier said than done, obviously, but just really hammering in on doing we, – we need to play solid for four quarters. We need to focus on – playing the game, playing mistake free yes. for four quarters, limiting mistakes. And and I think they'll be fine the way forward and, you know, hopefully get into, you know, using that playoff word a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, which is a good thing to hear um, around this team, considering where they were last year. And I, I think this team has made a lot of positive steps, positive strides uh, under first year head coach, Arthur Smith, and that will do it for the fourth quarter. So let's go ahead and bang the sound effect. And that is also going to wrap up another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. You guys know what to do by this point. Head over to iTunes or Spotify. Uh, Hit us up with a rating and a review, five stars preferably. And after you're done with that, be sure to subscribe um, on those two platforms. 
but also check into the Falcons Podcast Network for Falcons Audible with DJ Rackley, DJ Shockley, and Dave Archer. We we like to review what happened. They set you up for the next upcoming game that uh, comes out on Wednesdays, so we've got you covered. What happened after the game and what needs to happen in the in the next game. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us for another edition, and we will talk to you next week after the Falcons play Tampa, still looking for their first home win at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. 